Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Pixel Perfect Podcast. I'm Paige. I am Aaron. And I did say Pixel Perfect Podcast this time right out the get-go, so <laughs> woo, me. <laughs> uh, welcome back to our second Twitch uh, live airing of the show. Very excited. Which is hopefully more organized than our first live stream on Twitch. Like, I feel like we've been saying that every episode, no matter what. So I'm not going to get Disorganized is our brand. <laughs> It's right. it's our brand. That's gonna be the teacher. It's just like disorganized by nature. It's just that'll be the whole thing. <laughs> oh man! But uh, if you haven't seen by the title today, we're talking about Axiom's End by Lizzie Ellis. Lindsay Ellis. I can't talk today. I. But I don't know if you want to give a background on who Lindsay Ellis is, Aaron, because you know her better via your viewing. Than the- uh yeah, I watch Lindsay Ellis obsessively. Every time she comes on the video, I watch it. Um, I've seen pretty much all of her videos, except for um, Vintage Lindsay, which is an, uh, another channel she has from her back from her uh, Nostalgia Chick days. What does that mean? So, do you remember the Nostalgia Channel? Channel Awesome? Nope. <laughs> really? The Nostalgia Critic? You never saw the Nostalgia Critic no, at all? No, not at all. Okay, well, th- these were these assholes who <laughs> basically ran a YouTube channel. Okay, good. And he was just, it was like a gimmick thing. I, I'm not even sure. I think it's still on there. But like, it was a gimmick thing where you would give reviews for movies and he was really angry. Okay. So whatever. But, like um, justifiably Lindsay, angry or like rudely angry? I don't know. It was just, <laughs> he was just terrible. I'm, I've only seen like two of his videos and I was like, this is awful. But they held a contest. They were a pretty big channel at one point. They held a contest to who was going to become the nostalgic chick. And then Lindsay Ellis won said context, and that kind of jump-started her career and her, like, fame, quote-unquote. Like, gotcha. she's pretty famous at this point, but, yeah. like, she's, like, um, she's, like, indie famous. Right. Yeah. Okay. So that kind of jump-started her career, and then after Channel Awesome fell apart because of all of the allegations of, you know, uh, employee abuse oh, wow, and I haven't heard of this. sexism and racism and all that stuff. You can, there are many, you can check out Quentin Reviews did a good okay. channel awesome thing. I think you mentioned that um, before. Yeah. yeah, so yeah, so she won that and now she does her own stuff which is awesome. Yeah, she, and she's she a does, video essayist. Is that her like official thing? Yes. Yeah. Yes, and she's also the co-host of a um, musical podcast not musical as in it's musical, musical as in the genre. Okay, like about So musicals. it's a podcast about musicals. Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah. So, and then she also does PBS It's Lit, and she's kind of yeah. does, oh, has her hands actually, in actually, I had to watch things. one of her videos for my class. Like, I think, oh, no, maybe it was a video you sent me. Am I making things up? I, I definitely sent you a video that was the history of up. sci-fi. Maybe that's what it was. <laughs> Yeah, I had I sent you one of her PBS it's lit history of sci-fi. Yeah, definitely quality material videos. worth watching. She's also yeah. a Hugo award winner or finalist, something one, one of finalist. those finalist, yeah. Which yeah. is pretty cool. For her her documentary on the Hobbit, which was really well done. Mm-hmm. It's a really excellent documentary if you're interested in it about how the Hobbit screwed over New Zealand. Yeah, oh yeah. So, I feel like needless to say, she knows her shit. So, like, she's yes. not just, like, some dumb YouTuber who was like, I'm going to write a book and I'm going to get published because I'm famous. Like, she's got a lot of experience and background that led up to this book. Including a lot of historical research about kind of, like, she dealt, like, she's got this one video that I made Paige watch about Independence Day versus World of the World, War of, War of the Worlds, <laughs> <laughs> where... Uh, she kind of delves into aliens and kind of like their history within film and what they represent, which is good about Axiom's End, which very much goes into Axiom's End. Yeah. That's kind of stuff she's interested in. Yeah. Um, I'm actually very scared to do this episode. Oh, God, why? Are you scared one day she'll see it and then she'll never want to talk to yes. us? Yes. Oh, no. Yes. <laughs> I was because thinking that, too. <laughs> Lindsay Ellis is, like, internet omnipresent. <laughs> so, like... I, I think it's the reason, like, well, you haven't tagged her in any of the posts. Oh, God, no. No. Because, <laughs> like, <laughs> um, cause I'm just, like, I'm just, like, afraid she's going to listen to it one day and either discover that we're 
idiots who don't know what they're talking about. Fair. <laughs> or like memeify us somehow. Yeah. I'm like just... it's really egotistical to think about because of course we're not nearly that oh, important. God, no. Yeah. But it's still like Like we don't le- we don't we're not on that level, not but at the same close. time, like it terrifies me. I I think that means that we both have a similar opinion of this book then, if that we're both scared to do it because clearly this is not going to be a glowing review <laughs> of this book. Like it though i i have liked like it split opinions about it like i like it for certain reasons and dislike it for others leaving me in this weird gray area of like I don't, i'm not sure how i feel about it you um you sorry i just got a work thing off the side <laughs> and now i'm concerned um you read more sci-fi than i do a little bit. I haven't, like, super delved yeah. into the genre yet, but, yeah. I feel like... I think I've seen more sci-fi TV and movie shows than I have consumed literature. But, yeah. I feel like... And this is not, this doesn't just apply to sci-fi overall, but one of my biggest problems was, like, the pacing and the energy of the book... And then, like, our main protagonist, I did not find super engaging. <laughs> I'm assuming you mean Cora. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, we should probably tell people what the book is about. That might help. <laughs> yes. Yes. So, as usual, spoilers ahead. Yes. Um, I don't think we've ever made, like, not really a spoilery-free Mm-mm. anything. Absolutely We're pretty... not. Yeah. So, Axiom End is a novel about a girl named Cora who is kind of a mess. She's a hot mess. That's and accurate. <laughs> <laughs> her dad is kind of an asshole who wants to, who has this thing called, uh, tr- it's like truth is, a, truth, yeah, yeah. Uh, truth is a, yeah, truth is a human right. So he leaked a memo about kind of aliens being on earth. Yeah. And it's kind of her about her discovering that that memo was correct. And then there's um, Aliens on Earth, and she connects with one of them named Ampersand. And it's kind of about their journey through navigating the U.S. government yeah, cause it's and like, his family. Ampersand's whole thing, like his culture, is like him and his group have just survived like a genetic purge from where they came from, which is called the superorganism. And he uses Korra as an interpreter throughout the book, hence the development of their relationship and why she gets roped into, like, all of the shenanigans of the whole book. And her aunt works for the government as well. So, like, she's, like, her family is very connected to this whole situation from the various roles people play. Her aunt was let go after the memo was released because everyone believed that she re- that she leaked it to her brother. Yeah. Who is the asshole. Yeah. The bad father who just abandoned his children he's like the ultra conspiracy theorist just like putting shit out on the internet stoking all the fires yeah. yeah which i think it's interesting because like you kind of wonder because you hear that the entire book that he's a narcissist and you kind of wonder at points if it's like what if it really is some sort of like i wondered at some point if it was literally just people being angry because he was their direct family and they, he kind of just mm-hmm. abandoned them. Yeah. And then you have that email at the end, which shows like my family getting detained was really well timing. And yeah. you're like, Oh, he really is an asshole. He really is a piece of shit. <laughs> He's really just a piece of shit. <laughs> so I felt like that was interesting because we didn't really see anything non-public facing until that email. So this is a very intertextual book. So you have blog posts and you have news articles and you have the email at the end and it's 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 the um chapters are a little broken up by these things yeah um like which i found to be interesting i think i liked that part i thought it provided yeah. interesting context and kind of helped guide where like the next few chapters were going so i liked that and component it, i found the stock yeah, it, information unnecessary though on the chapter headers i was like this is providing me no context we all know the great recession happened shortly after this <laughs> i think the point of it was to show because there's that whole thing where he says people are blaming me for the fact their stocks have gone down. Mm-hmm. So I think that was what it was, is providing that information. 
But I think that could have, I feel like that line could have been fine on its own. Like, I didn't, I don't feel like I didn't need the numbers. Like, that's, it's like a minor complaint. It, it didn't, like, make or break anything for me. It just kind of was like, eh, that's unnecessary information. I don't think I really paid attention to that part enough. It's just like, yeah, it just, it popped <laughs> yeah. up to me. And then I was going through, like, good read reviews, like, trying to see what people's criticisms were. So, like, it, like, figure out what I agreed with and what I didn't agree with. And that was, like, another person mentioned it, too. So, I was like, oh, yeah, that's kind of weird. But I think that also brings us to a good point that this whole book is set in 2007, which provides a really interesting lens of nostalgia on the whole thing. <laughs> it's also like a weird, um, cause Lindsay Ellis is very interested in the post nine 11 world. Yes. Which I was like, wow, she really like the whole Bush administration component and like it being post nine 11 and set in 2007. And I was like, how fascinating. I wonder why she chose that. But then just watching that video you sent me, um, comparing those two movies, I was like, oh, this is something she's really actually very interested in and is a recurring theme in the content that she produces. So it's like, that's that's very interesting. 9-11 is a big... Um, she really... I won't say likes, because I feel like no one likes anything when yeah. it comes to 9-11, <laughs> but like... <laughs> she has a fascination with examining media pre and post 9-11 mm-hmm. and kind of how it just changed literally everything in American culture. It was just like the big catalyst yeah um for massive like if you watch the video about independence day versus world of world you kind of see how um people were no longer interested in disaster movies and were no longer interested in seeing things like people like die and monuments being destroyed because we literally just went through it Mm -hmm. yeah so it's so it's just like this big huge change and shift and she's very much in that world of like what happens if this happens post 9-11 yep. particular yeah because that's like post the patriots act and it's post the war and it's like all of this right first and also to the crazy stuff. stuff is still very like hotly in the situation versus like setting it in 2020 you feel a little bit more removed from it so well yeah right pick up on like the distinctions <clears throat> oh yeah but 2007 is so close to it still yeah exactly yeah so yeah it's I feel like it, it really works for her, and I think it really works in the story to have it be in 2007. Yeah, I definitely liked the setting. I think, I feel like the nostalgia components got a little heavy-handed every now and then, and I was like, okay, we get it, you're a fellow millennial, and you like tapping into all the things we like reminiscing about. I was wondering about that, because I feel like for Lindsay Ellis, it feels more organic to me, but like, there's also like, there's this moment... I don't know if you would have picked up on it. The sweet um, summer child thing? No. Okay, we're not thinking of the whole, then. <laughs> the whole plate. The whole plate? Okay, so there's this time after she orders a bunch of pancakes and she says she finished the whole plate. The whole plate. Uh-huh. So this is a reference to her YouTube videos called About the Whole Plate. Oh. Which has to do with Transformers. Oh. And she did, a, she did an entire series on teaching media and film theory through the lens of transformers and it's called the whole plate oh fascinating so when she gives this throw out about finishing the whole plate me as an avid Lindsay ellis yeah. fan is like ah, i see you well that's a fun little i Easter see egg. you that like yeah i definitely didn't pick up on that but no it was just like certain certain references were like really hammering in what the culture was like in 2007 and it like i just it just seemed like a little over the over the top to me sometimes and then there was at some point where Kaplan calls Cora sweet summer child and I was like is that a thing people said before Game of Thrones and I just didn't know it or <laughs> is it a Game of Thrones reference I have no idea but I did really like the what was it at least it wasn't a Nickelback shirt oh yeah that was that was good <laughs> there were some moments where I was like yes yeah. this feels yes um, but I can see what you mean. I think I think I might have been a sufferer of because this was Lindsay Ellis's book. I was already inclined to like it. I get that. That's probably a good thing that you are more her fan, and I was less involved in knowing who she was, so we can have like the, a different perspective. I mean, I think I generally liked it. I don't think I'd read it again, and I don't think I'm gonna read the sequels. So I'm probably gonna read the sequels we have to let me know how they i go. mean <laughs> i think it might be partially out of fan obligation mm-hmm. but i'm going to read them i i was <sighs> Lindsay alice i'm so sorry if you ever hear this um i was expecting the writing to be a little better 
yeah. than it was. I was because she's a really because she's a really good scriptwriter, and I was expecting it to be a little more little more of a deft touch than what I got. Mm-hmm. Like I feel like it's a little bit like like we get exposition through people talking to us. Mm-hmm. Like uh, like all of it. Mm-hmm. And then <laughs> there were just moments like I remember reading the very beginning, like the opening which like the opening paragraphs and I was just like It was a little clumsy sounding. Yes. Yeah. I mean it just I and I really I think I was just having unfair expectations because it is a debut no- novel mm-hmm. do you know what i mean like it, it has the same problems that any first novel would have right yeah and i think i was expecting them to not have that problems because it's Lindsay ellis yeah right <laughs> but it's still a first novel by a first time author and it's always going to have those kind of right concerns and she did get like, like a legit book deal and everything so who knows what kind of pressure she was facing <laughs> excuse me deadline wise or like someone being like we're gonna get this out when we're gonna get it out because like to me it was just like it needed just like a leather layer of polish to me like i felt like it was almost there it just was like a little clunky in places and like yeah clunky would be the word for me because there were just bits and pieces where i was like this could have been smoothed out and this could have been like so i feel like it's just i feel like it's a good debut novel i can agree with that um I, was, I can definitely, I, like, I've read other debut no- novels, and I'm like, wow, this is garbage, but this, I, w- I would agree it's a good debut novel. It's very average to me, so, like, I feel like it's better to be average than bad. <laughs> I mean, I feel like the ideas specifically about the aliens and what they are and the relation between the alien and the human, I think is unique and very interesting. Mm-hmm. I think she had has a general... In terms of ampersand and how he works and how everything goes, it's a very unique idea. Yeah. Like, um, like I think she's got a good thing going. I can agree with that. If that makes sense. I feel like a lot of first contact based things are usually like it's an immediate enemy versus enemy thing, and there's like there's no communication. Like I, I don't think we see a lot of that in books or movies or anything, unless it's like supernatural in terms of like transformers or like the avengers there's like some magical or special being or something like that but like too the way ampersand is like physically like what he physically looks like and how he acts and how he talks and then like their level of communication and how she starts to learn what his offensive and defensive Mm -hmm. kind of movements are is very Again, I'm going to use the word unique just because I feel like I feel like Lindsay Ellis has just been just been absorbing all of these aliens, and she's like, I'm going to make a better, more unique alien that actually feels alien. Yeah, because it's that balance, right? Because you have to have it human enough that we can connect with it, but also still have it be alien, right? And have like the reminders that like this is not a human. I mean, that, I feel like that's a, a huge component of the book, considering. Again, spoilers, the very last line is Ampersand saying to Korra, but I am not human. And, like, yeah. just leaving it at that. So, like, that's definitely, dude, like, she did a good job honing in on that component. I that's think so, sense. too. Yeah. Like, I think she achieved what she was interested in. hmm I think. I was going to say, was... like, I wrote some notes to myself about, like, why I think it's a good piece of literature and that people should read it. Because it does a good job exploring the themes it set out to explore. But yeah. I think in terms of, like, just being, like, oh, is it a fun book with, like, a fast-paced plot and, like, well-developed characters? To me, that's where it kind of lacked. That's where it fell a little flat for me. Well-developed characters. Because I feel like it's pretty decently paced in a sense that there's always things going on and you're always either learning new information or you're always like moving. I felt that way more. So like the second half felt better paced to me. The first half, I kind of felt like we were chugging along a little bit and then it picked up, I feel like in the second half. And I was like, this is a better pace. I just feel like it's the character development. That's, I mean, obviously I feel like actually ampersand gets the most character development of the entire novel. Yeah. I feel like Cora I don't want to say she doesn't change, but at the same time, I feel like she also doesn't change. She just hot messes her way from one situation to the next. <laughs> she does. <laughs> She's just, 
she's just a hot mess from beginning to end. I'm trying to decide if I liked her. Yeah, I don't. I don't like, know. but I felt she she's almost a little too. I don't want to say hollow because it sounds too mean. I don't want to say blobby because that sounds mean either. Yeah, I just I feel like there's not enough substance to her. Right, like she just was very eh to me. Like very yeah. Like I didn't I didn't hate her. I didn't like her. She was just kind of like, oh, you're just there propelling the story forward. She felt a little Bella Swan to Ampersand's Edward. A little bit. There was this kind of a Twilighty component, especially when it kind of got weirdly romantic towards the end, and I was like, oh, this is the shape of water. <laughs> What's going on here? Uh, which is, I was wondering about that. I was also wondering, because I was kind of starting to ship her with Saul. Saul. Oh, I'm so Saul. glad I'm not the only one who thinks that. It's Saul. Yeah. Like Saul. Saul yeah. Solomon, so Saul. Yeah. 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 Um, I was, I was like, she needs to tell us what his age is, because I'm kind of into this. <laughs> yeah. I was a little bit where I was kind of like, especially once they started changing and she started calling him Saul and then they started having more into moments where he would like let his guard down in front of her. Mm -hmm. And like, as this was happening more and more, I was like, I kind of ship this a little bit from what I have. I ship it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, But then the weird stuff with ampersand started happening and I was a little bit like, is this supposed to be romantic? Is this the intention or is it supposed to be just fraternal? Yeah. I don't know. I, cause the way the Sim Files, which is like kind of like their alien version of soulmates, I guess is the best way to describe it. So they have Sim Files, and Ampersand had two. Like they had like a grouping of a Sim File, and there was nothing like inherently romantic about it, it seemed, but very much like losing them was like losing part of yourself. So it's like it's it is hard to read how we're supposed to take him bonding with Cora that way. Like, is it romantic? Is it familial? Like, I don't, I don't know. Interested to see what happens between her and Saul, and then between her and Ampersand. Yeah, which might be why. So, I actually, to, to be <laughs> fair, she's at least bisexual. Yeah, she's got girlfriends going on. Yeah. So, I mean, I mean, I guess I'm assuming she's bisexual because I'm shipping her with Saul, but she could just be gay. That's true. And, so and I am just more like and, a family thing with Ampersand. And and Saul. It would be more yeah. of like a weird thing with Saul. But I guess I the text kind of indicated me that there was something going on between her and Saul, so I started shipping him. Mm-hmm. And now I'm just remembering that she's had girlfriends her entire life, and now I'm a bit like, all right, well, maybe. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I, th- I know me and you both definitely tend to, we're good at finding the romantic undertones for things because we like that stuff. I mean, it's true. <laughs> I am always, always on the ready to find romantic undertones. Yeah, that's 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 my kind of thing. I don't know. I guess like if you had to give this a star rating, what would you give it? Can we do halves? Sure. I would say like three and a half to four. Okay, I feel like I'd give it a solid three. So I, I think that tracks with with how we're feeling about it. I just I feel like it was in many ways solid mm-hmm. i feel like it just needed a little more refinement yeah right but i'm glad you it's... brought up it being a debut too because i always like i forget that it's like it's okay to go a little easier on a debut book <laughs> i mean all debuts ha- suffer usually from the same problems what and what exactly is is that like the the criticisms we've been giving usually clumsy writing there's usually a, a little bit of that going on. There's usually a bit of more muddled arcs. Basically, just things in general, including the writing, are a little more muddled. Okay. Cause, like, they're not quite as clear-cut and concise and I think that makes sense. Solid. Because I feel like one of the few authors I've read like all of their stuff, sometimes I go back and reread it, and I'm like, I can definitely see a difference in voice in your, the first few works versus the more recent stuff being like much more polished. It's like they haven't quite found their footing yet. Right. Yeah. And it takes time to do that. So. Yeah. I agree with that. When they um, don't hate us. We do enjoy you. Yeah, I mean, I, I love you. For you. <laughs> yes. And I feel like Lindsay Ellis is aware, too. I feel like a lot of debut authors who, ha- who like, know their stuff and who are because I've seen tweets from her that make it seem like she's aware that there's issues in this book. Mm-hmm. I think her Instagram bio right now is like her saying her book is out and she's like, critics are calling it really weird. 
<laughs> like she's just owning it and I'm like that's kind of awesome yeah yeah so uh, I think that I feel like we're being fair enough that it's fine mm -hmm. like these are like we're you know having an actual discussion about the content of the book and how it works as opposed to just saying like this sucks yeah, like I definitely. Or this was really good. Some of the one star reviews on Goodreads, I'm like, these are unnecessarily hateful. Like one of them was all hung up on saying that Cora's family gets used as a plot device in the beginning, and then it's like nothing for the rest of the book. And I wanted to be like, what are you talking about? Literally, like every other chapter is Cora thinking about the consequences her actions are going to have for her family and worrying about them. Like, where were you? <laughs> yeah, and that's the whole thing when she makes the deal with Ampersand is like, I want to be able to get back to my family. Yeah. And figure out what's happening. Uh, absolutely. So, I I mean, I, I guess I can agree that they're not really present. Yeah, in the sense not... that I know nothing about them or their personalities or how they work or why they're important. But at the same time, like, they're very clearly there mm -hmm. in her thoughts. Yeah, they're, for like, the entire forefront book. in Cora's mind. And I'm like, I didn't really care to know what they were like because two of them were children. So I was like, I don't, I, we don't need to fully flesh them out. I mean, I was curious about her relationship with her mother, which mm. seems to be not, not great. Good. <laughs> not good. But definitely the more word count went into developing her relationship with her aunt. Yeah. And how that was going to work. Who I but obviously. Greatly. Yeah, I liked her too. Yeah. Well, she's just like a giant dork who's in her 40s. So I was like, that sounds great. <laughs> I want to be that person. <laughs> Pretty boss too. Yeah. She just, like, withstands three days of interrogation. She's just like, this is fine. Mm. This sucked, but it's fine. Yeah. She's like, I, I, can, I can get through this. Um, and she just, like, accepts everything and just like, all right, we're moving to the next step. We're protecting this little baby thing. Yeah. And anytime Cora calls her and is like, I fucked up again, Luciana's like, I'm there. Whatever. I, I'll come pick <laughs> you up three states over, I guess. What? <laughs> I just got out of jail, but let's go. Yeah. Right? She's the, she's the ride or die aunt. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god. Um, I wanted to ask you what you thought about, like, did you, with all the various descriptions of what um, the Fremdens looked like, or like the Similars, did you have an easy time picturing what they actually looked like physiologically? Because I struggled with Ampers that. Ampersand, by the end of it, I think I had a good idea. Okay. And then I kind of just, based on that, everybody else. Okay. Um, I, like, struggled, especially with, like, the head thing, because I couldn't figure out if it was, like, a vertical head thing or, like, a, a fan this way, like. I really wish Lindsay Ellis would release some art. Yeah, like, I need some. Like, like that's I, that's what I want, I is some art. I mostly kept picturing the Cocopelli dude. I don't know if you know who that is. <laughs> no. I'm going to find it and show you. Come on. I'm going to put it on, on screen for Twitch if I can. This this little dude. <laughs> That's what I kept picturing for for freaking ampersand. It's the little uh, Coca Belly. See it. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Like being hunched yeah. over and like having the thing on his head. And all the eyes. Yeah. The I think that was actually part of where I think I got confused was some of the writing needing polishing because I think she got kind of lost in her own descriptions of the sizes of things because at one point I thought he was like nine feet tall and then I thought he was shorter than that and I thought he was taller than that and then at one point she's describing his fingers as two feet long and I was like how does that work in context of the rest of his body <laughs> because once she described him as nearly the size of a small bus I was like oh he's much bigger than he's I thought huge. he was yeah yeah and I guess, uh, yeah, but I, I, they also kind of distinguish between when they're up and when they're down. Mm -hmm. Like, I remember um, the aunt talking about at neutral stance, they were this high. Right, which I'm assuming is like the hunched over and not like upright kind of thing. Yeah, so I think that that might be part of the thing is that there was some differentiation in how they look and did they depending just, on did their describe stance? the skin color i just kept picturing them really light blue I don't remember she uh said he that. describes them as like super white super white okay like translucent white okay if i am remembering correctly i think you're right about that besides like the genome which was different looking but but like like i i remember her describing it as like a white that feels like unnatural mm -hmm. so 
do you think she intended to set out to write a book that's kind of almost like a commentary on the way we relate to other humans culturally? I think I think it was definitely in somewhere in there is thinking about how we interact with each other and how we treat each other and how we treat the other because it was like she said in the video I sent you like their alien is never an alien it's always something else yeah yeah definitely. like terrorism or something like it never it's always about an other yeah so I feel like even if she didn't intentionally go out and be like this is going to be about how people treat each other I feel like there is a level there of understanding of how what aliens represent mm -hmm. and how they are kind of not perceived um like how they are consumed within media is that the right word is that what I, i'm thinking i think so yeah i'm not sure <laughs> i'm not sure either there was a thing there there was a thing. thought there that made sense and it got a little muddled it happens so yeah i think that i think that theme became most apparent to me when she had ampersand describing the way like if your a culture is different the other culture's gonna like try to like either dominate it or mold it into something it approves of and i was like whoa that's so true <laughs> also there's a little bit in that of, of how she has to constantly change what he says Mm -hmm. do you know what i mean like when she interprets she has to go he's like why did you change and he's like because you sounded extremely hostile and they're gonna right? think that you're <laughs> she's like Amber, you sound also... like an asshole <laughs> <laughs> she has to like mitigate how he talks and there's and there's very much a she feels more like a not the word not not catalyst what's the other c word no mediator mediator i think Between mediator the... yeah between the two cultures that's not a c word but it's fine <laughs> she's she feels like the bridge between the two cultures mm -hmm. and i feel like that's almost what the focus was was on her being a bridge more than her being a person yeah that might be why she felt kind of flat as a character for me was focusing too heavy on that and not i guess maybe if they maybe she had provided more context for the way being that interpreter was affecting Cora, I guess is that the I don't know if that's the way I want to do it a little bit there's that scene where she's like sobbing in a cupboard yes I liked that scene a lot I was like yes this is a very nice humanizing scene where we get to like understand how she's coping with this but I think I wanted to because she allegedly went not allegedly that she went to school to like study uh, linguistics but then like dropped out so I was like was this way a more considering half the book was about language yeah Uh, that's why I was like, I feel like they could touch on that more, like Cora thinking about the way school helps or like what her original career goals were and like how is this changing her life further. I'm now realizing as you talk, I know next to, no next to nothing about Cora. Right? <laughs> they give you like I little think, tidbits and that's about it. Yeah. I think this book does what it sets out to do. I just feel like in terms of picking a main protagonist who has to be that bridge, it becomes not very, not not interesting, but just not very relatable. Yeah, exactly. I guess there's there's nothing relatable about this book. No. Which I think is a problem because you always have to have that nugget of, like, relatability. Because even if you're like, well, I hate my dad, but it's, like, not a hate your dad on the level of, like, he's internationally creating problems mm -hmm. and using my family's literal detention in order to push forward his own agenda. Right. So I think it actually kind of comes back to our avatar versus Cora discussion because both of those shows had really great messages to explore, but one of them was character driven and one of them was not. And one of them worked better than the other. And it was the one that was more character driven. Sci fi and fantasy both tend to be more plot driven than character driven. Mm-hmm. I just feel like when you're going to have the one protagonist who drives the entire story, you have to have a little bit of character. And I mean, like, there is those moments where she makes decisions and those decisions have impact. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, when she decides to go back, because when she starts hearing the screaming as opposed to just running away like she was told. Yeah. And when she decides to save the, I'm going to call it a big genome, when she decides genome, to save the, yeah. the, the, the genome instead of, like, letting it 
go. Like, she makes decisions and those impact the way things go. Mm -hmm. It's more just, like, I don't understand entirely why she made those decisions. Yeah, her motivations are unclear. Yes. I feel like that's, like, she's, it's care-driven in that sense, but in another sense, I'm like, I don't understand why these various things are so important to her beyond the fact they feel like something morally you should do. Mm Mm-hmm. Do you know, like, they feel like, like, moral decisions that pr- a lot of people would make, probably. Right. Yeah. But I wish I understood better why she specifically was making them. hmm Yeah. I mean, I, I guess my only thought would maybe, would be, because, like, you can see how much she cares about her family, so, like, you can see why she might be motivated to take care of others, but it's not, it's not explored enough, so you're kind of, like, left guessing. I think she, in general, is not explored enough. Yeah. Yeah. I just feel like Lindsay Ellis isn't nearly as interested in her as she is in Ampersand or the Bond. They ha- I feel like she's almost more interested in her Bond to Ampersand than Cora herself. Mm, yeah. So, but you have to have Cora because Cora is the bridge. So you'd have right. to, I don't, I don't know how you would fix it necessarily. I just know that there's something happening here. Yeah, I don't that know either. That needs to be resolved on some level. Yeah. We got a lot of, we get, we're pointing out all the problems. We have no solutions. <laughs> We have no solutions. It's tricky. I mean, it it is a a good book. I actually I think its themes are so well explored that I feel like this is one a book that should be read in like high school. Like I would I think this is worthwhile literature that would stick around for a while. It's just like it's lacking in the fun department. <laughs> I I feel like I learned a lot and it was really interesting i wouldn't qualify the experience i had as necessarily fun or i I don't want to say it wasn't enjoyable no but i wasn't riveted but there's a middle ground in there yeah there's a middle ground in there between like enjoyable and not enjoyable and this book falls in between that but yeah i mean that that i would say that is my general consensus i think people should read it i think people should give it a shot I, i think a lot of people will like it as it is it's already got a 3.98 rating on Goodreads, so people are liking it. <laughs> you love science fiction, you should definitely read this book. Like, if yeah. science fiction in general is your jam, definitely read this book. Particularly Aliens it's, and It First is worth Contact. your time. Yeah. Yeah. It is, it is definitively worth your time. Mm-hmm. It's, and it's quick. It's not, it's about yeah. 375 pages, so it's like, it's not yeah. a huge endeavor. No, and it's a fast read too. It's not like there are there are places where it lags or it gets kind of bogged down with what's having to happen and how it needs to be explained to you. Mm, yeah. But in general, I would call it a fast read. Yeah. I, would I think that. I feel like it's almost because it's a little too bogged down with its, its ideas. Yeah, because I think the parts for me that really like brought the plot to a screeching halt was when we started getting too into like the machinations of ampersand society and i'm like i'm lost <laughs> i don't know what you're talking about right now and i feel like that was kind of the point of this book was to really explore aliens and how they work and how they like you know what i mean mm-hmm. um it just feels a little heavy-handed yeah yeah i can agree so. with that but yeah so decently decently good book you guys should check it out that's my final consensus i'm assuming you said me too but discord's doing that thing where it doesn't want to tell me what you're saying (laughs) said i did say me too okay i which is a thing i'm glad i figured that out that it's not your headset it discord just sometimes drops audio for no reason great thanks discord right I noticed Fun. that was happening, like, if I played games with Brendan, I'd be like, I can hear you in real life over there, but I have no idea what you said in here. Okay. Do we have any yeah. other final thoughts, things to say? I don't, but if anyone has questions or thoughts they want to share, they can go for it now. Um, and while we're waiting, we'll let you know that next week we're talking about the Dark Souls franchise series, whatever you want to call it. I'm very excited. We'll see if that actually gets people to watch us on Twitch. Yeah, right. <laughs> because they'll just be like, oh, Dark Souls. No, wait. They'll be like, I've been tricked. <laughs> this is a trick. So, yeah. Dark Souls next week, 6 p.m. I was looking at our calendar because I was looking to see what's coming up after that. Yeah. We are doing a Milan episode in December. Um, yes. Which, um, where it's going to be like late to the game, but based on some reviews I'm seeing, I'm deaf. It's going to be an interesting episode, I think. 
actually curious. I haven't looked at any reviews, but I just heard from my I've husband that they're headlines. a little mixed. Yeah. Yeah, so I'll be interested. I'm kind of happy that I didn't spend $30 on it. Me too. Is what I'm gathering. So we'll see. It's just a lot. I, I don't think I spend that much money on movies ever anymore. And yes, yeah, you're correct. I do love Dark Souls. This is my second favorite series. <laughs> I get it. I get why they did it, but it's just, it's not great. Yeah. So, especially because uh, you have to have a subscription. Yeah. You have to like double down on it. So it's like basically $37 right. at that rate. Right. So. Oh, bad. Well, we don't have any questions at this time, but if you guys have thoughts you want to share, you can definitely, you know, hit us up on Twitter or Instagram and, you know, we'll catch you guys next week for some Dark Souls. Is that all? I think so. That's it. All right. We'll see you guys next week. Bye. Bye.